Self storage development step seven, more finishing touches. One of the most satisfying things to watch in this development, aside from the buildings going up, was probably seeing the asphalt go down. So originally, I wasn't planning to have any asphalt on this property except for the driveway because I figured it would be too expensive and just not necessary. But after meeting with another local storage facility owner, he convinced me it was worth it because gravel grows weeds and it also turns into kind of a muddy mess in the middle of the rain. And there can be other issues with snow plowing if you do it. They just doesn't look as good as asphalt does. But one thing I didn't realize was that I can actually save a lot of money by putting down just an inch and a half of asphalt instead of the regular three inches like you would normally see on a regular driveway or a road. And if I just wanted to get rid of the worst parts of gravel and still have a pretty resilient product that would be sufficient in a low traffic application like this, an inch and a half of asphalt can work pretty well. And the other facility owner I met locally did that at his properties and they've held up well for like 15 years. So I knew if we did this and did it right, it wouldn't be something that would just fall apart a couple of years from now. So we ended up doing three inches on the driveway where all the traffic would have to come in and out of the property. But then as soon as you turn into the facility and you can either go right or left or straight, we paved a path to the buildings with an inch and a half of asphalt. And then all around all of the buildings, we did an inch and a half of asphalt. And the extra cost of this asphalt was around $55,000. So definitely not cheap, but I think it'll be a pretty good long-term investment. And the reason we didn't just go ahead and pave the entire thing with an inch and a half of asphalt like this was partially so that we could save on cost, but also because we're planning to add more buildings in this graveled section over the next few years. And it just felt kind of dumb to put brand new asphalt on there that would get torn up in a few years when we put new buildings there. So once this thing is all built out, we'll probably put asphalt around everything. But for now, we're just going to leave it gravel and use it as an outdoor RV and boat parking area. And as a result of putting this asphalt around the buildings, we also ended up adding some curb and gutter around this asphalt area to dress it up a little bit and also just help control any potential erosion issues around the asphalt. And this added some extra cost as well. We could have done crushed rock around this and we did end up adding a little bit of that in some specific areas because we were having some erosion issues there, but it also just doesn't look as nice as an actual proper curb and gutter does. But as you can see from the results, having asphalt around the buildings makes a huge difference in the aesthetic look of it and also just in controlling like the flow of water so that when we get heavy rain the water just drains to the appropriate place without just creating a big muddy mess and even with the added cost i'm pretty glad we did this and since this gravel area was going to be a parking lot we had to figure out a way to indicate parking spaces which ended up being a bigger challenge than i thought it would be the challenge was partially in laying out the spaces in a way that would be easy enough for people to back in in their huge RVs and boats. And once we knew how to lay it out, we also had to figure out a way to put down parking lines that would actually stay on gravel and also indicate parking space numbers in a way that would be visible whether there's snow on the ground or not. After looking at a bunch of different ways to do this and implementing what we did, I still don't think we have this completely figured out. There are several different ways to mark off parking spaces like this, but none of them are perfect and they all have trade-offs. We ended up getting oil-based paint sprayed on the gravel to indicate the parking lines, which has actually stayed on surprisingly well over the summer, even through a few very, very hard downpours and a few storms that blew wind all over the place. I'm actually surprised to say those lines are still pretty clear, and I'll be interested to see how well they hold up after the winter. That could be a different story, but time will tell. I've seen examples from other storage facility owners who will nail down yellow rope or barricade tape. This example here was from the landing RV storage facility in Missouri. So in our situation, we could nail this stuff down over the yellow lines that we've painted. So if the yellow lines ever disappear, the barricade tape would still be there. We haven't done that yet, but it may make sense to do it at some point. I found it's actually extremely difficult to nail or pound anything into gravel. I mean, it's almost like you're trying to pound it into concrete because that gravel just locks together very, very well, which you ultimately want because you want a stable, flat surface. But as soon as you start trying to pound bolts and stakes and stuff like that into gravel, it's harder than you might think. We ended up putting together these parking delineator posts that are kind of like a remedy that I learned from another storage facility owner here in town. And they actually look pretty good and the cost was pretty decent too. That was the main reason why we decided to make them this way. But I 
will say they do blow around and rotate pretty easily when the wind catches them. So I'm not totally sold on this yet. We may need to come up with another solution. I think our next step, if we decide to ditch these, will be to use some kind of a small rubber parking bumper. And the downside of those is that if you get a lot of snow, you can't see them. But uh, on the flip side, in the middle of the winter, there's probably not a whole lot of people coming and going from the parking lot anyway. But I think that uh, rubber parking bumper solution may be a little bit simpler and less expensive and you won't have these issues that we've been having with these uh, parking posts. And one other issue we're still trying to work through with our parking lot is that we've gotten some feedback from our first parking tenants who have said that our parking spaces are too difficult to back into. And they're actually set up so that you can pull through them, but you can only pull through them if there's not somebody else parked on the other side. And uh, after thinking more about this, I can kind of see how our layout would be a little bit difficult to back a 40 foot RV into because some of these spots are 12 by 40 feet and most of them are 12 by 30 feet. And so I was looking around at some of our local competitors to figure out how do they do this? Because I know there's other people who have parking lots like this and they're always full. And I noticed that all the other competitors near us have laid out theirs so that the spaces are all pull through. Like there are no parking spaces that butt up against each other. So there's like a single row of parking spaces, then a drive lane, and then another row and then a drive lane. And it seems to be a lot easier just logically thinking through it to allow everybody to pull through. If I could start this all over again and redesign it from scratch, I would probably do it where every single parking spot is a pull through. But the downside to that is we're gonna end up losing some parking spots if we do it that way, because we can't cram them all in there as well as we have with our current design. So we're gonna keep our eye on this and kind of reassess over the next year if something needs to be changed. So another problem we had to work through on this facility were some erosion issues in a few spots around our site. The way this site was originally laid out, it was kind of bowl shaped. So we had to do a whole lot of excavation work. I've got a whole separate video explaining all that if you wanna check it out. But as a result, we ended up bringing the whole site down a little bit. And right in the corner, we had this really steep bank. And if we had a higher budget, we could have spent like $100,000 to put a big retaining wall here because it was so steep and a retaining wall would just make it a lot less steep and would help control these erosion issues where all the dirt starts sliding down the hill when we get a big uh, downpour. So we could have done that, but we didn't technically need to. We could get away with just having a really steep bank here. But the problem with having a steep bank is that, you know, it erodes very easily until we have grass with root systems to hold the dirt in place. So our excavators had to fix this steep bank a couple times as it started to erode with the rain. And uh, the other little erosion issues we were having were by our retention pond where the curb and the gutter was. So we had two major blowouts from torrential rains that just showed up out of nowhere while we were waiting for the grass to grow. So after trying to fix this a few different times, we eventually said, ah, the heck with it. And then we put those big rocks there, which fixed the problem. So another big finishing touch in this development was the fence. And back in the design stage, I was thinking about putting up a high-end wrought iron fence because I thought it would just look really nice and it would provide the best security because people can't just snip the fence and go right through it. But the biggest downside is it would have been a whole lot more expensive to do that. I know some facility owners just don't have a fence at all and I kind of envy them because it's a huge cost and maintenance issue that they don't have to think about. But what fences do is they provide this illusion of security. And the fact of the matter is if somebody really wants to break into your facility and steal something, they can find a way to do it. And no fence is gonna keep them out. If they really wanna get in, they could drive their truck through it. They could snip the fence. They could climb over it. There's no such thing as a 100% secure fence, but the fence does provide some kind of perception of security. If somebody sees a fence, it's gonna tell them, hey, I probably shouldn't go in there. And it helps if you put signs on there indicating, just so you know, you're trespassing you're not welcome unless you're a tenant. I also thought about doing a rubber vinyl coated fence because again, I just thought it would look nicer. But I know over time that rubber vinyl can wear off as well. I've seen like 20 year old fences where it doesn't really look as good as it used to. And then I also thought about doing like a seven foot tall fence with barbed wire on the top. But eventually I had a moment of clarity when another local storage facility owner told me that fences just keep honest people honest. And uh, I realized, you know, it doesn't really matter what kind of fence I put here, if someone really wants to break in and steal, they can find a way to do that. The fence is more about adding that perception of security. So at the end of the day, I went with a six foot tall steel fence with no barbed wire, pretty basic, 
and that still cost me over $100,000. Fences are not cheap, especially when they're as big as this one is. And another interesting thing, so way back after I had just bought this property and it was zoned residential and I had to get it rezoned to commercial, I had reached out to all the neighbors just to let them know what I was trying to do and to come to me and talk to me if they had any questions or problems with that because I didn't want them to show up at the zoning meeting and give me trouble. And there was only one neighbor that responded. It was the neighbor directly to the north. Her request was that we leave some trees between our properties so that they could keep some kind of visual privacy there, which we did end up doing. We left about 10 feet of trees there on the north end. But uh, even after doing that, it still eliminated a lot of the visual privacy that used to exist between our properties. This was kind of a bummer. And I actually live in a house surrounded by trees and I appreciate the visual privacy that it gives me. So I could definitely empathize with her. And I agreed to put up some kind of a visual barrier between our properties. And uh, at first I thought this was going to be like fence slats. So I ordered a package of fence slats and I put them between our fence and it actually looked pretty sharp, but they were very, very slow to install. Like for me or anybody to install this along 440 feet of fence would have taken days of nonstop work to do this. It was just a super slow process. And even though they looked good, at the end of the day, they only provided about 85% coverage. You could still totally see through them. And I also looked into having my fence company install these and they would have charged me like 8,000 bucks to do it, which just felt like a ton of money for fence slats. And eventually after looking around, I discovered a type of fence privacy fabric that you can tie on the fence with zip ties and it gives a much better visual barrier. You can still see through it a little bit, but for the most part, you can't. And it also allows a little bit of wind to pass through the fabric, which is actually important because whenever you're covering up a chain link fence like this, what you're kind of doing is you're converting it from a fence into a wall. And you have to think about if there's any wind that goes through the property and there definitely is wind on ours, that extra wind load can potentially damage your fence if the posts are not thick enough. Our posts are about two and a half inches thick in diameter, which is actually pretty good according to the fence company. And they told me that if I added fabric, it wouldn't damage the fence at all. And uh, the best part about this fabric was it was way cheaper than fence slats. It was about 20% of the cost of fence slats. And it was much, much faster to install. And it actually looks pretty good. It is important that you actually pull the fabric pretty tight because there's a lot of wrinkles in it. But uh, as long as you do that, it's a pretty sharp end looking product. Now, another significant finishing touch to this facility, which kind of goes hand in hand with the fence, is the gate. And the gate often ends up being the biggest maintenance issue. Like if anything is a problem or if anything breaks or needs fixing, a lot of times it's that gate because it's something everybody has to pass through to get in and out of the place. In my area, every other storage facility uses the cantilever style gate, which just kind of rolls open and shut. And this kind of gate is less expensive, but apparently these can be more susceptible to maintenance issues in the winter especially because they have to roll over snow and ice and if you get a really solid freeze or if the snow plow pushes snow in front of the rolling mechanism your gate is down and as you can imagine if your gate doesn't work it's going to be a huge pain for everyone involved but apparently this style of lift gate has less of these issues in the winter because it doesn't need to roll over anything it just lifts up and down but they're definitely more expensive even so my goal was just to eliminate as many potential hiccups and maintenance issues as possible. So I chose to spend more on this kind of gate. And to my knowledge, I think we're the only storage facility in our area that has this kind of gate. Now with every gate like this, you need to make sure it works with your management software because it's not just about installing the physical gate. You also need to figure out what kind of management software you're going to use to you know, collect payments and let people rent online. And then you also need to get keypads and what they call a gateway, which is like the computer that communicates with your management software in real time online. So that when somebody rents a unit online, they are immediately given a gate code that they can type into the keypad and then open the gate and then get in and out. And we have our setup with two keypads that you have to type in that code to get in and you have to type in that code to get out. And the reason we have it set up that way is so that we can track who is inside the facility right now and who is outside of the facility. So the property management software that we're using is SiteLink. And then the hardware that we're using to open and close the gate is from OpenTech. Now, one huge advantage we had was that the building inspector gave us a temporary certificate of occupancy, which meant that we could open up one of our four buildings to start renting out space
databases and generating revenue. And uh, since it took us basically all summer to finish this up, it was a huge help to be able to get this temporary CFO and open up one of our buildings because it gave us a few months during the busiest season of the year to start getting tenants. And during this time, we filled up about 40 units and we got some nice revenue coming in to help offset the interim interest that we were paying and just to hurry along this lease up process. And uh, when we finally did get our certificate of occupancy and when we were able to open up all the rest of our buildings and be fully operational, we didn't actually have to change that much about our marketing because we had already started doing everything we needed to do. We had our Google listing up with quality pictures and good information and the phone number worked and the website worked and new tenants were able to do everything they needed to to rent our units. So there you go. That concludes this video series on my first self storage development. I learned a ton in this process. And with everything I know now about how this works, it would be kind of a shame if I didn't do another one of these at some point, because there are a whole lot of things that would run a lot smoother and that I would do a little bit differently on the next go around. Not that I think there were any major mistakes or errors in this process, but you know, you just learn a lot from doing this. Thanks again for watching. If you wanna check out more self storage investing content, be sure to head over to RE Tipster. We have a whole section on our site that's dedicated specifically to self storage investing. Investing. I'll include a link to that beneath this video if you want to check that out. Thanks again for watching. I'll talk to you next time.